In a little over three weeks, voters will decide whom they'll be sending to Queen's Park in two by-elections in the province. And joining us now with the latest, Martin Redcon, Ontario politics columnist with the Toronto Star, and Scott Stinson, columnist at the National Post. And it's good to see you guys back again, first time in 2014. Thanks, Steve. You saw the Hudak interview, you saw the three MPPs. What jumps out? Two things. One is that he is not running away from his right-to-work labor flexibility program. He made it very clear uh, tonight and also as he has in, recent w in, in Ottawa a few days ago, uh, last month in a speech to the Toronto Economic Club, he believes pretty strongly in right-to-work. I think we have to give him credit for saying it and standing by it. And Even though you he, think he's wrong on it. <laughs> totally. But if he ran away from it, I think he would look foolish at this point after 18 months or two years of, of, of pushing it. Uh, while I don't personally agree with it, I'm allowed to have opinions, I don't think he's crazy to run with it. I think a lot of journalists do. Um, journalists tend to be pro-union uh, unless they work at the National Post or the Toronto Sun. But, uh, <laughs> but I think if you look at the polling, the province is deeply split, split on right to work. So I, I don't think it's a crazy idea for a Tory who has almost no union support to begin with to be saying he wants to go after unions. Yeah, certainly distinguishes himself from the other sides in the debate. And stands sure. to gain with very little to lose, I think. Okay, Scott? Yeah, I, I still think it's interesting that he hasn't, I mean, you, you sort of tried to pin him down specifically, will this plank, as it's in your white paper, be in the general election platform? And he would say, there are many different ways of doing it. And, and I think it's interesting that, you, Martin, you mentioned the speech to the Economic Club. He was unequivocal that this specific proposal is like part of their plan going forward. And given opportunity since then, he has sort of said, we'll, be, we'll see what the details are as they come forward. And which isn't to say he's running away necessarily, but he does seem to want to give himself some wiggle room as to what the specifics of the proposal will be. So I just think it's a bit interesting, and I don't know if it's because the by-elections are on and he doesn't want the issue to sort of cloud the platform that they're putting forward for the by-elections, but it does, a bit of a surprise to me, seeing as how he had been so unequivocal before that now he's kind of introduced a little bit of waffling on it. But I think, I think you've hit on it. I think it is because of the by-election in Niagara it's a fairly pro-union region. Why leave yourself open to counterattacks there from the NDP, which is your major opposition in Niagara, when by-elections tend to be fought on local issues, local candidates? So he's saving that, I think, uh, when I spoke to him about it um, in late December on, for example, another favorite issue of mine, the beer store. Mm -hmm. He didn't want to talk about that either. He said, I'll have more to say about that in the election campaign. So mm -hmm. I think he's keeping his powder dry on right to work for the time being. We'll see more of it later. That's not to say he might recalibrate it in some way, but I don't think he's going to renounce it in any way. Okay. And it's clear for voters it's coming in a Tim Hudak government. No doubt about that. The Million Jobs Act, do you think it'll create a million jobs? I don't. I, I think that the, the clearly it's a number that they like and they want to be able to put it on the banners and that's why they've called it the Million Jobs Act. I think for other reasons we've talked about, you know, it's there are so many pieces involved in what creates jobs. You can't really set it as a government and say this many will be created. The other part of it is that it's an eight year plan. And I mean, who knows what's gonna happen between now and eight years from now. So, you know, even if they do have some success for some period of time creating more jobs through a number of measures, it's, you know, very hard to be able to forecast something eight years out and say we're going to still be creating the same amount of jobs in year eight that we are in year one and year two. So I think that part of it is basically sloganeering. They wanted to be able to slap something on a sign and so they figured out a number and they liked a million and well, if the, it works for that. If the National Post is not in favor of the <laughs> Million Jobs Act, I can only imagine what the Toronto Star thinks about it. Well, first of all, thank you Tim Hudak for uh, unveiling it in the Toronto Star first. So he, he actually ran it in an op-ed and, and, and uh, we were able to, to announce it to the world. I love the, the, the thinking behind it because every time I see the One Million Jobs Act, I think of a million man march on Washington or a one million votes plan because it's it really is a piece of political symbolism or theater. The only thing economists can agree on uh, eight years down the road is that in the, in the long run we're all dead or we're politically dead. So he will have had a good run as premier if he gets in on that promise and he won't be held accountable to it. Uh, look, a couple of things. One is if you ask him what's the econometric underpinning of this, what's the research analysis for the projections going forward, all he came up with at the time was if you divide one million by eight, you get 125,000 jobs. And that's not much of a 
an underpinning, an economic underpinning. Well, other than he said they did that during the Harris years. That's the second thing. He said if you go backwards in time, which is not a really good way to look forward in time because past performance is not really an indication of how your investments will do going forward. Uh, he said, yes, the Mike Harris government did it, and you've heard your, your other guests have said uh, tonight and also last night that that was a completely different era, and I won't repeat, but well, I will just say this, the Canadian dollar was a lot lower than it is today. Sure. Now, Tim Hudak might actually be lucky because we're seeing currency depreciation right now, so who knows? I mean, a lot of economics is luck, but that luck, I think, is where, is where opportunity meets preparation. So mm -hmm. he needs to do some preparation. He needs to have some underpinnings. And the proposals he's making, other than one, which I like, which is improve apprenticeship and job training, I think he's on solid ground there. And a lot of liberal policy wonks will agree that there is room for criticism there. A lot of the other stuff is more aspirational than really serious economic things. Well, it's out, Scott, it's out of his hands in some of the cases. Free trade among the provinces, sure. that's nothing he himself can do right and yet it's a major underpinning of one of the five points yeah and and I should I, I more I'm skeptical of the slogan and the title of it and you know but I think some of the stuff that he's got in there um, trying to bring energy costs down you know a lower cost base for businesses as a way to stimulate the economy and get businesses to invest in the province I agree with that stuff in theory but even on the energy rates thing I mean there's some dispute as to whether or not the Tories could actually do anything about that in the short term. Because a lot of it's locked in. It is, and it's yeah. not the kind of thing where you can just rip up contracts and boom, energy costs will go down. So and, the and to be fair, yeah. he's not actually promising to reduce, if you look at the fine print, he's not saying he'll lower hydro rates, he's just saying he'll hold off on the increases. And right. most of the increases that annoy people so much now are not a function of green energy. That's just starting to trickle into the system and will ramp up. Most of it is investing in the infrastructure transmission lines that the Tories were not that good at keeping up to date. But here's why this may, and none of us knows, this thing's been out for two weeks, it's hard to say whether or not it's caught on yet. But let's bring this graphic up and you'll see why this may catch on. Look at the rate of unemployment in Ontario, the red line, versus the national average, which is the blue line. And Ontario's unemployment picture is worse than the national average. So it's reasonable to infer from that, I guess, Scott, that this guy thinks this is a vote winner and Million Jobs Act is a pretty catchy title. Yeah, Fair? I don't think there's any doubt that he would love to see the next election be fought on issues of the economy and, you know, liberal quote unquote mismanagement of it and the fact that. The, the Ontario economy has lost jobs at a quicker rate than the national economy and hasn't recovered them as well as you know the federal government has and the deficit here is going to be much higher certainly per capita than the federal government and their you know their uh, targets to balance the budget are much further off so I think you would love to have all those issues and present the idea of Ontario in severe economic decline and we're the party to come in and clean it up I do wonder whether the public will want to hear that message. It's not an easy one to sell on the campaign trail. And when the alternative is a government saying, we're not presenting tough medicine, but we want to take care of you and we want you know, these various things to happen to make your life easier, it's going to be a tough message, I think, to counterattack. And, and having said that, this has been Hudak's plan for some time now to, to you know be the party of serious economic change and you know tough medicine yeah for better or for worse martin he has made his decision to plant his flag firmly on the right come hell or high water and he's going to go up or down with it he's not pussyfooting around on the right and on the economy which is probably the right thing to do let's not forget the ndp can be weak on the economy you know your their economic development critic made a a, a valiant critique of the other two parties policies but her own party is generally not looked to by people in tough economic times as a place they want to be at. Uh, the Liberals have a Premier who has performed pretty well so far but she's not really seen as a as an economic steward she's seen as somebody who's more social policy and empathy and conversations so so Tim Hudak has an opening there whether people find him credible is another matter and I think or his he, prescriptions too hard. Or his prescriptions um, but I think he's right to tap on, tap into the economic anxiety that I think really is underlying uh, provincial voters' concerns. I think, especially if you stay outside, if you look outside or go outside, as I have, the GTA or the GTHA, uh, you're the H. Thank you. Your roots, Hamilton. Thank you. Uh, KW, Kitchener Waterloo, uh, Ottawa. Beyond those metropolitan centers, the economy is going so so. But the anxiety, I think, is even higher. And we know that unemployment went up from 7 point, it jumped from 7.2% uh, to 7.9% in January. 
I think that might be a bit of a blip, but it's still a significant number, and there are about 580,000 people unemployed in this province. Not one million people, as Tim Hudak told us when he unveiled his million dollar, it was like perfect math symmetry, one million, one million. There are actually only 580,000. He came up with one million as the jobless number because he, he did some mathematical calculation about discouraged workers and so on. But there are 600,000 workers unemployed here. Today. Okay. Let's uh, look at in these by-elections. Uh, Thornhill, former conservative seat. Niagara Falls, former liberal seat. You've been up to Thornhill, Scott? Yep. What's it looking like? Well, the one thing I, I was a little, um, I shouldn't say surprised, but there's been this notion, would Thornhill, who, which the voters liked, Peter Sherman, the former MPP, you know, would those votes necessarily stick with the Tories? Just in the few conversations I had up there, everyone seemed to say overwhelmingly yes, that that is not a, <clears throat> a, a loyalty to Sherman that's going to cause people to rethink voting PC, even though his departure from politics wasn't exactly the smoothest. Um, so they seem to think that it's going to be a, a Tory liberal fight and that the Tories are well positioned to defend it anyway. You know, I think it'd be close. Um, and you alluded to this in your discussion with, with Mr. Hudak that they have not done great in by-elections. And so even though they are One now... One for seven. Yeah, even though they are now looking to be ahead, you know, who can try to really trust the polls these days, but they appear to be ahead in both. Um, but having said that, they've tended to underperform on by-election day. So, you know, I think they might need to have decent leads going in on both. Let me bring you to the Niagara Peninsula. Niagara Falls, how are you handicapping that one? Well, let's, uh, let's, let's set the stage. Fort Erie is Tim Hudak's hometown, and it's in his riding adjoins uh, Niagara Falls. So there's a lot of pressure on Tim Hudak there. We've said already that it's a, it's a pro, it tends to be pro-union. And the second, the third issue is that it is, uh, there's a lot of anger against the Liberals because of the racetrack uh, and, and gambling uh, proposals they brought in that have taken some money out of the community. But if you're feeling like the government, you're hard done by it with the government, would you then turn to a Tory uh, candidate who tends to also be getting government out of the way, cutting subsidies, reducing other kinds of supports? Uh, that tends to help the NDP, and they have, a, they have I think, a, a strong candidate there. So I think the pressure's on Hudak, and as, as you say, he's one for seven. If he ends up one for nine uh, with, with Niagara Falls and Thornhill, that'll, that'll That'll be humbling for him. Uh, there are all kinds of explanations for why the by-elections haven't gone his way, but politics is a lot about optics. And mm -hmm. normally, a by-election is the chance for voters to kick the government in the pants without kicking them out of power. For the NDP to be scooping up so many by-elections is, is awkward for him. And, well, and Thornhill, the Liberals are, are still in contention. Sure. I, I think the Tories mm -hmm. are the likely default candidate. But if he, and the NDP are nowhere in Thornhill. So if he loses both, that's awkward. Having said that, here's the conventional wisdom. You tell me what you think of it. Conventional wisdom is if the NDP wins Niagara Falls, which is not a seat they've ever, they won it, I guess, in 1990 when they formed right. the government. Right. That will embolden them to pull the plug on the win government at budget time and we're into a spring election. Right. Yes or no? Well, I think that's true, but I also think if they don't win either, that we're going to have a spring election anyway. Okay. Because I just can't see unless the Liberals fold their tent on transit taxes and tolls, um, I can't see a scenario where the NDP is going to support a win proposal to impose taxes or tolls to fund transit, which she has said backwards and forwards she intends to do in the spring budget. So I think we've kind of reached the point of the minority government where you know they finally run up against a policy that they're not going to get either party to support. So everyone sort of anticipates the spring election, and I think the by-elections are kind of irrelevant to that process. I suppose there is a scenario where if the Conservatives win both, maybe the Liberals and the NDP figure out that it's in their both of their best interests to, <coughs> to come up going. to some sort of compromise. Right. And maybe they meet quietly and say, what does it take you to sort of, you know, what do we have to take off the table for you to give us your support? Okay. That could uh, happen. Uh, I know we're talking Queen's Park, but something federally <clears throat> happened today that was of interest. we got a minute left. Let me give 30 seconds to each of you just to react to Justin Trudeau's idea to kick all of the liberal senators out of the caucus and that they will now heretofore sit as independents. They're not going to be quote unquote liberal bagmen anymore. Mark. Fascinating, surprising. Uh, give it, it, I hadn't thought about the Senate much ever since uh, Ontario decided it was going to try to reform the Senate, which is a non-starter. Uh, abolition has been my position and, and candidly that's also a non-starter. So Justin Trudeau's proposal is an interesting way to break the logjam, the, the sense of disgust that people have with a Senate that doesn't do much of anything. 
I do have a sober second thought about this, though, which is I'm not really sure how this would unfold because I happen to be, even though it has a bad name, a believer, not in the Senate, but in party politics. I do mm. believe in teams. Otherwise, you get the disarray that you have at yeah. City Hall. Well, he's definitely departisaning things in the Senate. Last 30? Yeah, I, 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 I agree that it's certainly bold and I mean who expected this to happen? I think the, the big question is going to be what happens if you have a completely nonpartisan Senate? Will it be doing anything? You, you know, if you're going to have a government that passes laws and you get a whole bunch of nonpartisans in the Senate, are they going to block new laws? Are they going to actually start doing things? It just seems even more strange that you'd have these completely unaffiliated people in a, se in a second chamber that's vetoing, you know, the will of the democratic elected government. That's, who knows, we're a long way away from that actually happening, but that's kind of, you know, a, a new world that I don't know anyone really wants to contemplate. Has people talking about the Senate, though, in sure. ways that don't involve expense accounts. <laughs> so maybe that's to the good. Sure enough. Scott Stinson, Martin Redcon, good of you guys to join us tonight here on TVL. Thanks a lot. Pleasure. Thanks, Steve. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.